Welcome to Alive Wesleyan Church. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Let's stand and lift our Lord's name on high this morning. Sunrise, <laughs> turn it around and put it like this. 
Um, so we've ordered 20 more, uh, hoping that you all kept yours from last year's like we did. I had to dust it off a little bit, but uh, we hope you can haul out your ones from last year. But we have ordered 20 more that will be coming this week. So. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Elena Jones and I'm the VBS leader here at EWC. VBS is so close to my heart. I grew up in an unbelieving household, but because VBS was free and then I could go. It was a safe place where I was loved and more importantly told about the gospel. I know that my teachers prayed for me, though I don't know where they are now. I wish I could tell them how much I treasured my time there and the lasting impact it has had on my life. Fast forward to the night of August 2nd, 2019, after the closing VBS ceremony, my only thought was, when can I get my hands on next year's VBS theme? Never did it once cross my mind that church doors would be temporarily closed seven months later. COVID changed so many things about our lives. We all probably thought we were unfathomable, but none of this was a surprise to God. Change is a difficult thing, and so I'm so proud of how this church family adapts so well. So after two years of interruption due to COVID restrictions, I am so excited to announce that VBS is back this year, and this year's theme will be monumental, where children will learn about, experience, and celebrate God's greatness. And never has there been more important time to bring this message to the children in our community. This year's VBS will look a little different, especially with all the brand new volunteers out there. But the one thing that will remain unchanged is the importance of wholly bathing this ministry in prayer. In 2019, over the course of five days, 48 different children walked through these doors and heard the good news, and eight children made the decision to make Christ as their Savior. None of that would have been possible without God in your prayers. So I have made up a guided VBS prayer calendar again this year. They're on this beautiful paint colored paper. They're available in the overflow, um, off on the table as you exit. The calendar starts next week, which is April 3rd, and there's only 16 weeks of VBS. What? So please pray with me in the ministry and pick one up, and I ask you, ask you to be in prayer and ask God how he wants you to use you in this VBS. This magnet is from my very first VBS I attended when I was a little girl back in 1992, way too many years to count <coughs> 30. Um, so it's more special to me now than it was back then. It lives on my fridge, and I think and pray of my old teacher, Jennifer, every time I see it. So who knows where the lives of all the kids coming in this summer are going to be in 30 years. God knows, and God has a place for you if you're willing to serve. and joy um, that you bring to us, God. I just thank you for everyone who's here and um, the way that they've touched my heart, um, Lord. I just pray um, as we go into the service day that you will open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us, um, calm our hearts, and um, yeah, just thank you in your name. Amen. Well, before we release the kids for uh, Jamie Kids, uh, this, tomorrow we're going to start a, a new sermon series based on called Witnesses Resurrection. And each week we're going to show a video uh, of someone who's a part of that or witnessed his resurrection or had their life challenged through the resurrection. And this morning we're going to start with Mary Magdalene. So if you guys want to start with the first video. to me, to my heart, marking me so deeply that, well, you don't know the level of repulsion people feel for you until you spend a good portion of your life not being looked in the eye. That was my life up until the moment Jesus found me. state he found me in. So we packed, we cleaned, and we gathered for three years, though it felt like only days. And then the time came. Well, until his days were accomplished and he did what he came to do. If you've 
walk to life anything like me, you know what I mean when I say that sometimes people try to put onto you what Jesus removed. He was only gone from us, what, a couple of days the first time it happened. That mighty, miraculous morning, I went to the tomb, and he was very not dead. He called me by my name, and he gave me very specific instructions. So I ran to tell the disciples what I had seen, that he was alive. And they didn't believe me. I mean, had they forgotten that we stood shoulder to shoulder all this time? I may not be one of the twelve or eleven now, but I followed him just the same. But you know what? Their perception of me is not the image Jesus saw. I was no longer the cracked and crooked house that demons dwelt in. Because the moment I realized Jesus believed in me, I believed in him. And eventually the disciples, they'd come around. Jesus kept appearing to a few, then to hundreds. still be some who didn't believe. He warned us about that. But more importantly, there would be other people, many other people who would never see it for themselves, but still believe. So that's why I, why we, Keep going until we reach every person who once and for all is done with disbelief. Right. Well, this time we release the kids. They want to head down to Sunday school. This morning, before we have our, our normal prayer time, morning is Alan Kenzie's last Sunday, and uh, I want to call him up here. I want to pray for you guys before you leave. And uh, you guys come up here and ask Pastor Larry. He wants to come up here, and we want to pray for them. Uh, but it's been a, a blessing to have the two of them with us. Uh, wherever you want. Uh, they've certainly been a blessing to me, and I know they've been a blessing to the teams, the youth group, blessing to a lot of you. Uh, so... We want to celebrate them, send them off with our blessings and our prayers, uh, celebrate with them as Mackenzie has a new position at Beaver Camp, a, a Christian camp uh, that they're excited to go to, a camp that they worked at, met at, right, took the teens on a, a retreat at, uh, so she's going to be starting a new position there soon, uh, so we want to send them off with our blessings. After the service, or in between services, in the overflow room, there's cupcakes and cake, uh, so we want to invite you to celebrate with us, celebrate with them. To make sure you show your appreciation, tell them thanks. Uh, but we want to pray for them before they head off. So, Pastor Larry, if you want to start, and I'll close. Gracious God, we come to you this morning thankful for the gift of Alan and Mackenzie to us in the past year and a half. We thank you, Lord, for all that they have given to our church and in particular to our youth for their heart, for their study, for their uh, presence with our young people and all that they have poured into them. We give thanks, O oh God. But Lord, now we send them on a new mission and we pray that your blessings would be upon them as they go. And we pray, O oh God, that you would fill them anew with your Holy Spirit in the new tasks that are out there before them. That you will use them in mighty and wonderful ways out into the future. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, I do as well thank you for Tom and Kenzie. Lord, I thank you for bringing them into the life of this church. Father, for the way that you work things through your sovereignty. Father, I thank you for this past year and a half that they've been a, a part of our church family, a part of our lives, a part of the teen's life. Father, I thank you for their hearts, their willingness to step up and to serve, their willingness to pour into the teens, to prepare lessons and hang out and do all the great things that they have done with the teens, Father. And so, Lord, I thank you most of all for their hearts and, and Lord, for sending them here. And Father, along with Pastor Larry, we just pray now, Lord, that as they, they go out from us, Father, that we'd be able to celebrate that as they go on to a new chapter that you have, have written for their lives, Lord, that you'll anoint them in fresh, a new, fresh way, Lord, as they serve, Lord, that they would go with our blessings and our love as they go, and Father, as they continue to serve you, Father. Lord, I pray that you'd be with them in a special way, that they would just enjoy the time that they had here, Lord, in great ways, that they would have great memories, Father. And Lord, we would just uh, thank you again for them, for their service, for who they are. Pray for your special blessing upon both of them, for their marriage, their lives, their ministry, Father. We pray all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Continue our prayer time now, and uh, ask if there are any requests. Uh, just a couple of other announcements to make. Also, is that uh, as already has been announced, there is a prayer vigil that we have done for several years that begins on Thursday night of Holy Week at five o'clock and goes through the next 24 hours, ending at five o'clock on Friday, just prior to our Good Friday service. There are sign up, there is a sign up sheet over here. I, I don't think I, yes, I did put one in the back as well. So there's uh, two sign up sheets. Uh, several have already signed up, so we have a good start, especially since we got the 2 a.m. one filled. Uh, that's a biggie. And um, we'll ask for you to do that, and that sign up sheet will be there for the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, then also on Easter uh, morning, we are having an Easter morning breakfast, and so there is sign-up sheets over here for that, for your what food you can bring, and also how you can help with the setup and take down and that sort of thing. And Charlene is going to be heading that up. All right, with that, are there prayer requests that you would like to share with us this morning? Uh, first, of course, is uh, uh, we do want to remember the uh, uh, Norma O'Shaughnessy family. Norma passed away this past Monday and had the funeral on Friday, and so we want to continue to pray for that family. Uh, Alan? No, we just want to say thank you for everyone that donated to the spaghetti dinner. Yeah. Um, we just had so many donations <clears throat> between food and baskets and uh, I just want to say thanks to the teens for all their work that they did yesterday. Everyone else that helped. It was, it was a great night. So. Okay. Yep. It was a great dinner last night. We missed out on that. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you missed out on it. Um, any other requests? Uh, Penelope. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Driving in the snow here on this beautiful spring day. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, okay. Other unspoken. Sue had it. All right. And was there somebody? That, yes. Okay. Hi, Michelle. Okay, we've been praying for Jack for some time, and he is having another chemotherapy treatment this week. Okay. And let's continue to remember Sharon, of course, in prayer. Praise the Lord, she was out to uh, the women's group last Tuesday morning, so I'm thankful for that. All right, let's bow then for a moment of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you and praise to you for who you are. You taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May your name be honored. May who you are, your nature, your character be glorified. And we do at this time come to you with our praises because you are an awesome, great, wonderful God beyond words sometimes to express all that you represent, all that you are in your being, your character, and your actions towards us. The greatest action you ever took towards us, oh God, was to come as a little baby boy in a manger 2,000 years ago. Thank you for your redeeming and saving love that has come into our lives through Jesus Christ and is now real and realized in our hearts and lives by the Holy Spirit who dwells within. And, oh God, may we be a people that lives that out, that lives out the fact that Christ dwells within by your Spirit, and we are, we are the body of Christ in this world. We are how, we are how you are advancing your kingdom, your rule in this world. But, oh God, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because many a time, indeed, we do fail what it means to be kingdom people in this world. Help us, oh God. Lift us up. Help us to go back to it. To discern how it is you want us to be serving you. Not to fall into temptation, but to fight the good fight against the evil one and keep, keep pushing forward with your kingdom values that this world desperately needs. Lord, we lift up a few needs that have been brought to us here this morning. We pray, God, for the family of Norma O'Shaughnessy, that you will continue to bring your blessings of comfort and love and presence to each one of them and all of those that think about her and will miss her because of what a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful example she was of Christ's love. Lord, we pray for uh, Jack as he has, once again, another chemotherapy treatment this week. We pray, God, that you would help him through this time, that you would bring healing. Thank you for the good reports that tumors have shrunk, and we pray for your powerful healing presence to be there through this treatment. And we do pray for Sharon as well, Lord, that you will continue to help her and strengthen her. Thank you that she was strong enough and able to come out this past week, and we ask for your continued powerful healing in her body. Lord, watch over Larry as he travels to Baltimore. Uh, keep him safe on the highway, Lord. Protect him. And we pray that he would have a safe arrival uh, this evening. Thank you once again, O oh God, for the privilege of being here in the house of God and for each need that was represented by an upraised hand, we pray that you will just now, in these moments of prayer, help each person to know that you are at work with that need or for that need. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Eric and his ministry to us here and for his good sermons that he brings each week. And I pray for your blessing upon him once again, when he comes and he shares the word of God with us, Lord, may we all have open, receptive hearts to receive that word in good soil that much fruit may come from it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us stand as we continue in our worship this morning.
May I be seated? If you'd like to follow along, I invite you to take out a Bible, turn to the Gospel of John. This morning we're at the end of the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. This morning we're reading John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. John chapter 20, it's the fourth gospel. Verse chapter 20, we'll revert 1 through 10 together. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they went went going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple all ran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scriptures that said he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. God bless us as we look at it. Well, I said last week that this morning we're going to start a, a new series of messages as we head towards Easter called Witnesses that I've ever read. I would guess most of them would have ended in chapter John chapter 19. Right? The, the biography typically ends when the person dies, right? John 19.30, it says, Jesus bowed his head, he says it's finished, he bows his head and he dies. John chapter 19, verse 42, they take his body and they put it in a tomb. So, you know, he's dead, he's buried, biography's over, right? You know, a lot of great people throughout history, George Washington, Alexander the Great, Martin Luther King Jr., Julius Caesar, Elvis Presley, right? Their, their legacy may live well beyond their earthly lives, but their biographies tend to stop when they're dead and buried. And here is the life-changing difference between Jesus and everyone else. John chapter 20. As we keep reading, we find out what well, the story doesn't end in John chapter 9, right? The story keeps going. And as you turn the page in your Bible to John chapter 20, here is the wonder of Christ and why knowing him is the most important thing in life. Bible scholar Henry Morris once wrote, The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. But if it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. Well, what makes all the difference? John chapter 20. Well, what would it take for someone to believe? Right? Well, how about a witness, right? Someone who actually saw it. And that's, that's the purpose of this series of messages. Let's look at God's Word and see these people whose lives were utterly changed by meeting Jesus, and, and then how their lives were changed even more when they saw that he was resurrected from the dead. And, and let's begin with Mary Magdalene, right? It says it. She shows up in the all-important first verse of John chapter 20, right? A chapter that should not have been written if Jesus was just a, a normal man. Look at verse 1 again with me. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Right, here's Mary Magdalene. She's the first witness of the resurrection. But I want you to think back to that video, right? She describes herself in the video as an, as an object of disbelief, right? An outcast. And, and I assure you that if you had been around at that time, or if you had known Mary Magdalene before she encountered Jesus, she would have been the last person that you would have expected to be there in the midst of this story. And, and maybe we need to rewind and think about who Mary Magdalene was. Right, what do we know about Mary Magdalene? Well, it's interesting, in Scripture, Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in the Gospels, 
And 11 of those times are during scenes like this, right? She's at the crucifixion. She's there at the resurrection. She's prominent at the resurrection, the empty tomb on Easter morning. And in those stories, we see little glimpses of who she was. Mark, in his gospel, tells the exact same story as John. And he begins his writing in Mark 16:9. He says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. All right, what's one of the things that is always mentioned about Mary is that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. Right? She was demon-possessed at one point in her life, but then she crosses paths with Jesus that unforgettable day, and he sets her free. And it's interesting that that specific episode is never described in the Bible. Right? There's no Bible verse where it says Mary came to him, she's possessed with seven demons, and, and Jesus casts them out. But every single gospel writer keeps bringing that up about her. Right? She's always thought, thought of in that way. So think about it. Here's a woman who's broken, a dark woman, held hostage in a, a terrible spiritual pit, and yet her encounter with Jesus changes everything about her. And out of that brokenness, Jesus knew that he had an incredible plan for her life. Now there's also a bit of controversy when it comes to Mary, or I guess tradition that gets laid at Mary Magdalene's feet, because if I ask you, well, what else do you know about Mary Magdalene? Uh, a lot of people would raise their hand and say, well, uh, Mary Magdalene was a, a prostitute. And, and I want you to turn your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 7 and 8. We want us to look at something. So often when we, we see Mary Magdalene, that's how she's portrayed in movies, right? She's always portrayed as a, the sinful woman. But I want you to see something in your Bibles. Right? There's a, a reason for this. In the Gospel of Luke... He mentions her backstory in Luke chapter 8, verse 2. We're going to look at that in a moment, but we said that of the 12 times that Mary appears in the Gospels, 11 of them are at the crucifixion and the resurrection. Well, this is that, that 12th lost time. And we can read it real quick. Luke chapter 8, verse 2. It says, And a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Right, so that mentions her again, right? Here's mentioned again, she's healed of evil spirits and infirmities or, or sicknesses. Well, if you look in your Bibles and you look back to the previous chapter, Luke chapter 7, the previous story, which begins in verse 36, tells us about a, a sinful woman who comes to anoint Jesus' feet. A Pharisee has a, a dinner party. He invites Jesus as a guest of honor. As they're having dinner, this woman comes in off the street and she begins to anoint Jesus' feet, to kiss them, and wipe them with her hair. And uh, Simon the Pharisee, who is hosting this party, he thinks to himself, it says in verse 39, Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what, who and what manner of woman this was who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And so this story is immediately before the first time we're ever introduced to Mary Magdalene. Well, in 591 A.D., Pope Gregory the Great was giving some kind of sermon, and he got up and he pronounced that this sinful woman was Mary Magdalene. Well, if the Pope says something, it tends to carry a lot of weight in Catholicism and Christianity, and so this label was always attached to Mary from 591 A.D. on, right? It carries on to this day. And while it's not possible, it's possible that the same woman, it'd be very strange for Luke to tell first of the story and not mention the woman's name and then immediately introduce her in Luke chapter 8 and not connect the two. Not to say this is the same woman, right? Instead, far more likely truth is that Luke 8 is introducing us to Mary Magdalene and Luke 7 was a completely different woman. But even in Luke chapter 8, it tells us something about the situation. Look again at Luke chapter 8. This time let's read verses 1 through 3. Now it came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come up seven demons. And verse 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him, provided for him with their substance. Now, I want you to see something here. 
Ready to see something you probably never thought about? Maybe it'll blow your mind this morning. What's the significance of this short passage? Right? That you could preach a, a whole sermon from those three verses. Right? Think about what is the contrast between the woman in verse 2, Mary, and the woman at the beginning of verse 3. Right? In verse 2, we have Mary Magdalene. She's described as a woman who has been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, sicknesses. It states Christ has cast out seven demons from her. That seems like a, a pretty rough life. A dark past, right? Maybe something she is embarrassed about, something she is ashamed of. But then it immediately mentions in their company was Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart. So here you have Mary Magdalene, who has this dark and, and difficult past, right? She's by all accounts a downtrodden woman. Our video talks about her being an outcast and, and people discounting her of shame. But then it states she is serving Christ right alongside of Joanna, the wife of Chuzza. And Chuzza was a, a trusted and important official serving the king, right? He's serving Herod the king. So think about this amazing contrast of these two people who are serving Jesus side by side. One is an outcast, hurting woman who is demon-possessed, and the other is a rich, well-to-do socialite who's hobnobbing with royalty. One of the amazing things about Jesus' church is how it is meant to bring people together. Vastly different people together. Right, we talked about it last week with the Greeks who come to Jesus on Palm Sunday, how they were seen as outcasts, and would Jesus even accept them? And Jesus said to them, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Right, that's what the church is meant to look like. Galatians 3, 26-28, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, you just have put on Christ. And then that familiar verse, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So here's Mary Magdalene. Her name means that she was from a small fishing village in the sea, by the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. So much like Mary, the mother of Jesus, here comes a woman who's introduced into Scripture, who comes from this nondescript small village. And then you think about her past, right? How it says that she was possessed by demons. And not just possessed by one demon, that would be bad enough, I would imagine, but it always states she was possessed by seven demons. Right? Completely and utterly possessed. You know, she states in the video, that was her life until Jesus found her. What was your life like before Jesus found you? Some of you might really relate to Mary Magdalene's story, right? You can remember a time in your life where you were, you were pretty far down, or you were pretty far from God, or you were in some very dark times. The truth is, before we met Jesus, all of us were in dire straits. We may not have recognized it. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. But then the prophet Isaiah injects the, the good news of Christ, right? He finishes the verse by saying, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. <clears throat> Don't you think there are times probably in Mary's life when she felt pretty worthless? Probably times in her life when she felt uh, ashamed of what she had done in the past. What is the point? Do I have a purpose? I often tell people that broken vessels leak more water. I don't even know where I heard that from. Broken vessels leak more water. And what I mean by that is it's often people who have been hurt or people who have gone through struggles that more easily pour into other people around them. Right? They're already broken, and so it's easier for them to kind of pour into and help those around them that are hurt, hurting. And one of the enduring pictures from Calvary is Mary Magdalene standing there that she is watching the cross with Jesus as he's being crucified. And all the Gospels make a, a very poignant point to say Mary Magdalene was there watching Christ on the cross, right? When others fled, when most people fled, when his trusted disciples fled, Mary stayed. And I read this comment this week. It says that Mary Magdalene's presence at the cross meant Jesus would not have to suffer and die alone then there is no place she'd rather be. 
Mary stood her ground in faithful devotion and appreciation to the one who had claimed her amid her own hell on earth before Jesus exercised those seven demons. Before Jesus' miracle in Mary's life, she had suffered alone in repressing demonic oppression. Thus, she was not about to allow Jesus to experience any such solo suffering in his final hours while on the cross. There is something powerful about choosing to be present when someone is suffering and in pain. And Mary knew that firsthand. You know, sometimes our identity is, is stuck in the past. Right? That's who I was before I met Jesus. And maybe even like so many people kind of uh, apply to Mary this, this label that, well, Mary must have been a, a sinful woman, even though you don't really know whether it's true or not. Maybe there are labels that people put onto you. Well, that must be the way they are. Sometimes we listen to that. Sometimes we think that's our identity. But once Mary met Jesus, her identity changed, right? The, the old was gone. The new had come. 1 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The thing that I believe most changed Mary's life is that Jesus believed in her. Right? Maybe her old friends didn't believe in her. Maybe her old acquaintances didn't believe in her. Maybe even the disciples had a lot of questions about her. But Jesus believed in her. Again, he, he loved her and he saw something that maybe she didn't even see herself. He saw that she had value. Now I tell you the next story with a, a great deal of hesitation, because as I tell it, I know I can be shooting myself in the foot, especially if Magda hears it, so don't tell her. If any of you husbands out there, if your wives like to go garage sailing, this would be a good time to distract them or plug their ears. But Magda loves garage sales, maybe too much. But I, I came across this story from CNBC.com. And it talked, said this, Things bought at a garage sale don't usually end up on the evening news. But a Chinese bowl bought by a New York family became famous. The owners paid just $3 for what turned out to be a bowl from the northern Sung dynasty that was more than 1,000 years old. Until someone told them what they really had, the family had placed the bowl on their mantle over their fireplace. When they placed the bowl with Sotheby's auction house for sale, it was estimated to go for approximately $200,000. Instead, a dealer from London purchased it for more than $2 million. He asked, why would the first owners ever sell something so valuable for just $3? Well, the answer is they didn't know the value of what they had. And even the couple who bought it, bought it for $3 and put it on their mantle and sat there for six years. Imagine a bowl for sale at a yard sale, sitting on a table that worth, turned out to be worth $2 million. I'm going to hear that story every time Magda brings home something from garage sale. But I tell you that story because sometimes we don't know the worth of things. We don't know the worth of other people. And sometimes we don't know the worth of ourselves. And I'm talking about in God's eyes. It's funny, I, I wrote this sermon and finished it up Thursday. And, and went to the enormous funeral there on Friday. And Pastor Larry used this exact same quote, which he told me in the first place. But... It's from C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory. But it talks about the, the value of seeing other people. And C.S. Lewis in that quote from The Weight of Glory says, To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship. Right? When you look around you see other people in the church, outside the church, to think of them in God's eyes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I, I think Mary, the world saw Mary Magdalene in, in one light from the outside. But Jesus saw her as a wonderful child of God. And, and I think that is why Christ gives her the special honor of being the first witness to his resurrection, right? To remind her of his love for her. To remind her of her value. Now go back in your Bibles and look at the scripture lesson together. Mary Magdalene, she goes to the tomb. It's Easter morning. She's the first one to go. She gets there. The stone is rolled away. And, and I love in the video where she says, and he was not very dead. And she wants to share that good news. And we, we pick up our story in John 20, and 2 and 3. 
It says, Then she ran. She came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away our Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So, so Mary sees the tomb is empty and the stone is rolled away. She comes and she tells the apostles. And the truth is that the apostles at first don't believe her. Luke adds a lot more to the story. He writes, Luke 24, 11, And their words seem like idle tales, and they did not believe them. I'm sure that didn't help Mary's self-image either, right? And again, maybe she hears a, a quiet voice whispering in her ear, right? You, you are not worthy, see? These guys won't believe you. Right? You're still just a, a worthless piece of trash. No one values you. And they get back to the tomb, and, and Peter and John kind of look inside. The body's not there, and so they go back home. And here's Mary, and she's all by herself outside of the tomb. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, and she looked inside the tomb. You think as Mary was sitting there outside the tomb and the, the disciples hadn't believed her and now the body's gone, right? And she's, now she's hearing these voices whispering in her head, right? And, and she spent all that time filled with, with grief and sadness. Think about how Mary spent all day Saturday, right? Alone, grieving and mourning. But here's the beautiful part, right? The, the silence of Saturday... And whatever those voices were whispering in her ear about being unworthy is immediately replaced by the sound of hearing Jesus say her name. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is the saved teacher. Jesus speaks to her. Mary. I'll say that there's nothing more important that will change your life than hearing Jesus say your word, say your name. You can hear me preach. You can hear people preach. You can listen to pastors. You can read books. You can hear all about Christianity. You can be in the church for a hundred years. But until you hear Jesus actually say your name and speak to you as a child, that is what changes us. Not just hearing about Christianity, not just hearing about Jesus, but actually hearing Jesus. He says to her, Mary. Right? There are always going to be competing voices in your life. The question is, which voice are you going to listen to? Right? Maybe the world said to Mary Magdalene, her whole life, right, you are not worthy of anything. You're an object of disbelief. But in the beauty and the grace of Jesus, how wonderful it is that Mary Magdalene is the first person to witness his resurrection. She's the first person to hear his voice. She's the one who is honored. God loved Mary Magdalene despite her past, and God loves you despite your past. Trevor Chandler wrote, God did not love us because he had a need. God loved us because we had a need. And I want you to think about how powerful that is, or could be, inside the church. To come together, to see the value in each person, to pour out love. I read a quote this week that said, You never hear anyone say, I left the church because they loved me too much. What did Mary Magdalene do after she witnessed the resurrection? Well, I'll go down to verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Right? She went and she shared with others. Right, Knowing Jesus gave her a purpose. She said in the video, I was done with disbelief. There was a mission, right? A personal encounter with Jesus led to a corporate mission for Jesus. N.T. Wright wrote, Repentance and forgiveness of sins are not simply, therefore, a matter for the individual, though they certainly are. At the heart of being a Christian is the personal turning away from sin and celebrating God's forgiveness, which is, after all, at the heart of the Lord's Prayer itself. But these two words go much wider as well. They are the agenda which can change the world. They are the agenda which can change the world, right? Mary Magdalene's world had been changed. She goes and she, she tells people the good news, and that's what we need to do as well, right? She's the first Easter evangelist. D.L. Moody was once approached by a woman who said she did not care for his evangelistic methods. 
So Moody very calmly said, well, I don't care for them either. What's yours? She kind of hemmed and hawed and said, well, I don't really have one. He said, well, then I like mine better than I like yours. A recent Gallup poll indicated that out of all evangelical American believers, only 2% have ever introduced another person to Christ. But we have to do better. Easter is just a few weeks away. How can we share this good news with a world that's all around us that is hurting? Who do you know that needs to meet Jesus? The story of Mary Magdalene is the story of a person whose life was utterly changed by meeting Jesus. Whatever her life was before, that encounter with Jesus gave her meaning. It gave her purpose. It gave her worth. And what he did for her, he still can do today. Let's bow and pray together. Dearly Father, we do thank you again for your word. Father, we thank you that you do take people that are broken, cracked. Lord, that you make something wonderful out of their lives. Lord, that you took Mary Magdalene that had a past and a, a difficult past. And Lord, yeah, Lord, you used her in such a wonderful way. Lord, I pray that there's not a single person in this church that right now feels unworthy of you. Feels like they are worthless. Feels like they have no purpose. Father, I'm sure that there's everyone here has heard about you. I'm sure everyone here has heard sermons and Bible studies and Sunday school classes. But Lord, I pray in their heart that they would hear from you. That they would hear you say their name in a new way. Lord, that they would know that they have a purpose and a worth, regardless of what the world says, they have a worth that comes directly from being a child of God. So Lord, I pray that you speak into our lives. And Lord, as much as it's important it is for you to speak into our lives, I pray that once we hear your voice, that we'll know that we are to go and to be like Mary and to go and share that with the world. Father, it's not enough that we just hear the voice of God. It's not enough that we are saved, but then we're called to go and tell others. So Father, I pray that you lay that upon our hearts as well. Father, we thank you that you continue to pour out your grace and your love. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close the worship go?
we'll get after service and light you into the overflow room as we celebrate Alan McKenzie. Make sure you grab yourself a cupcake, and make sure you shake their hands, and make sure you tell them goodbye. Benediction today is from Ephesians chapter 6. Peace to the brothers, in love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ with a love that is incorruptible.